Welcome back, I'm Pastor Chris Titus and we're happy to see you again. Uh, this video is coming to you as one of the options for church. We also have services in Armada at 9.30 on Sunday mornings and in Allenton at the West Berlin Methodist Church at 11 o'clock. But this morning, let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we are always so thankful for the opportunity to step away from our busyness and to focus just for a moment only on you. Help us to do that today. Let us learn from your word about what you've prepared for us in heaven and let us be inspired not only by what you've done, but what you've called us to do to share our faith with others. And so help us to honor you with our words and our music today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we return to our discussion of heaven and those things that we can learn about paradise and what this place is going to be like, quite different than the world we're living in right now. And today I want to talk a little bit about the details of heaven, acknowledging that we're not going to be able to uh, clearly understand all there is to know about heaven. In fact, we'll probably get uh, very small parts of it correct. But the idea is to be inspiring and encouraging about what heaven might hold for us. And so we're going to have that conversation today. And again, we don't have any detailed answers about what heaven is like. And yet there are many who have written about it. But I would say that not contemporary pastors like John MacArthur or Alistair Begg or David Jeremiah, they don't know the details of heaven. And certainly great theologians like uh, Martin Luther and St. Thomas Aquinas or John Wesley, they didn't have the details of heaven. And then, of course, uh, Christian giants like C.S. Lewis, D.L. Moody or Billy Graham also didn't have the details of heaven. In fact, it reminds me a story of Billy Graham. He's in a small town. It's in the 1960s. He's gone there for a tent revival, and he wants to mail a letter. And so he stops a boy on the street, and he asks him where the post office is. And so the boy points to a couple blocks down the road and gives him directions. And afterwards, Graham says to the young man, Son, would you come to my tent revival and learn about going to heaven? And the boy replied, not from you. You don't even know where the post office is. The point is, no one knows the exact details of heaven. But that doesn't mean we can't speculate about what it's like and enjoy the prospect of knowing uh, more about paradise. We are to devote ourselves to study scripture and learn as much as we can, not only about the foundation of our faith and salvation through Jesus Christ, but also what God's plan is for us after this temporary life ends. And this is part of what we're talking about here, at least over the past few Sundays. Now, I'm not a famous theologian, but I would uh, suggest that heaven really isn't about the details, it's about the destination. And we need to realize that our eternal destination uh, as believers is to be with God in paradise, to be with God in his home um, that he has prepared for us. Thinking about these things pushes our minds. It causes us to hopefully mature in our faith and deepen our understanding of what God is doing and be inspired to share our faith with other people. That's why we come to church, and that's what we're called to do. This is Jesus' great commission of us to share our faith with others. Now, we first start out with the idea that heaven is not some cloudless neverland, right? Uh, the movies and TV often depict it this way, but that's not what really Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us, as we learned uh, several Sundays ago, that um, Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, and he says that in my Father's house there are many rooms. So there are guests, house guests, as it were, in heaven, and we are there as believers with Old Testament saints, and this is the group. And so it's a limited population in heaven, and when I say limited, what I mean by that is that the number there will be a specific amount. In other words, eventually, uh, when this temporary world ends, that will be the set population of heaven. And so what can we learn about this? Well, Jesus tells us just how limited heaven is going to be. Take a listen to Matthew 7, beginning in verse 13. Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, 
and many will enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few will find it. And so right away, this is kind of a startling statement that only a few are going to find eternal life. And what does that mean exactly? How many people will there be in heaven when this temporary world comes to an end? And this is something we can't know exactly, of course, but it might be fun to speculate on it. And so I, I want to do that just for a moment. I want to uh, acknowledge that we're not going to know the population of heaven, but there is a way that we can kind of speculate what it could be like. And I read an article that was very interesting, trying to get my brain around this idea of how many people will ultimately be in heaven. And the article noted that the world's population since creation is about 108 billion people. And this would be extrapolating numbers from birth rates and death rates over time uh, in the history of the world. And so uh, 108 billion people would be the total population of the, of the earth since creation. Now, I'm assuming that that would include uh, folks that uh, we know now and, and folks from the past. And the current population of the world is about 7 billion folks, if you include Armada and Almont and Allenton. So 7 billion folks currently live on the planet. And in that world's population, 31% claim to be Christian, about 22% claim to be Muslim, and about 15% uh, claim to either have no direct connection to God or they may be um, flat-out atheists. So those are kind of the three major population groups. There are other groups and other categories. They're much smaller. But 31% of people say that they are Christian, so that's about 2.9 billion people alive today claiming to be followers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Unfortunately, and this is my opinion and, and others, that a great number of that population are Christian in name only, in association only. In other words, they've checked the Christian box on a survey or a census, but they're really not followers of Jesus Christ in any concrete, demonstrable way. They just associate with Christians more than other groups. And so I want to pessimistically look at that number for a second. Uh, the survey said that 31% of the world's population was Christian. Um, I'm going to just arbitrarily say that that number is closer to 20%. 20% of the world's population is Christian. So if 20% of the world's population since the beginning of time were Christian, and you included Old Testament saints, 20 billion people in paradise, 20 billion people in heaven. And so probably a lot less than that, but that gives us some sort of broad number to consider. And so heaven is a vast place for that many people to end up there since the beginning of time. Now, this is a very unscientific calculation. I acknowledge that. But the idea here is for us to... Uh, come to grips with how big heaven is and how many rooms are actually being prepared for us there. Please don't stop me after the service and say, well, pastor, you are off by 105 million people. You could be right. I'm probably off by a lot more than that. But it isn't about the math as much as we look at the percentages. Say 20% of the folks um, who have lived since creation including Old Testament saints, uh, will be in heaven. Now, the opposite is also true. 80% then of the world's population since creation, including the present population, will not be in heaven. And this goes back to Jesus' reference to uh, wide is the road that leads to destruction. 80% of the people are going to follow that particular path and be separated from God forever. Thus, you can figure it out in your own interactions, in your own life. Maybe 80% of the people you're going to interact with are not going to have a heavenly destination, which should cause each of us to be sorrowful about that and to, and to go out and want to share our faith more passionately because we don't want them to end up in that uh, predicament. We don't want that situation uh, to be their eternal destiny. So, 
if there are 20 billion people in heaven, is it going to be crowded? I mean, that's a lot of people. So scripture does tell us a little bit about the size of heaven. So I want to talk about that for a moment. If you look at Revelations 21, beginning in verse 15, John is uh, telling us uh, in details what he heard and saw as part of his vision of heaven's capital city, the new Jerusalem. He records, the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it is wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 strata, which is 1,400 miles in length and as wide and high as it is long. So the capital city and its gates, uh, allowing people to go in and out, is 1,400 miles long, wide, and high. So it's a cube. The capital city of heaven, the New Jerusalem, is a gigantic cube. Pastor and author Randy Elkhorn takes those dimensions and extrapolates a little bit uh, to try to get a feel for how big that really is. So if you assume that this cube, the city of uh, the New Jerusalem, the capital city of heaven, is a cube, 1,400 miles long, wide, and high, and each, uh, each level within that cube had a ceiling of, let's say, 20 feet. So every level of heaven had a 20-foot ceiling. Um, Elkhorn speculates that billions of people could occupy the New Jerusalem with many square miles per person. So when Jesus says, in my Father's house there are many rooms, he's not kidding. This place is huge. So imagine going to heaven. It's not going to be crowded. We're going to have plenty of elbow room uh, to do all kinds of amazing things and still enjoy each other's company uh, when we feel the need to. And so heaven is this vast place with lots of room for all of us to go, and we don't have to worry about crowds. Uh, one of the things that is noted uh, in this uh, chapter of Revelations is that the New Jerusalem city, this gigantic cube, has gates. And so people can go in and out of the city into the countryside, which gives you the impression that heaven is also uh, bigger than this capital city. There is a countryside for us to uh, enjoy, which reminds me of a story. There was a man who was speculating and wondering whether or not there were golf courses in heaven. So he prayed about it, and that night an angel appeared to him. And the angel said, good news, there is golfing in heaven. Bad news is your tea time is tomorrow morning. I also heard about a group of women who were discussing the fact that their particular church was talking about heaven. And so the women got together, and after conversation, they all agreed that only 10% of the population of heaven would be male. Only 10% of men would make it to heaven. Later, when the pastor asked how they determined this particular figure, they responded that if there were more than 10% of men in heaven, it would be hell. Now, I don't think that's based on a true story, at least I hope not. But the capital city of heaven has plenty of space. I remember my first apartment uh, when I went to law school only had 250 square feet. And so literally when you open the door, you hit the back wall. We don't have to worry about that in heaven. There's going to be lots of room for all of us, and it will be a celebration to be there. Heaven is a city. Heaven is surrounded by countryside. And so this is what we have to look forward to. And the book of Revelations also tells us, of course, about this. But the book of Hebrews has some uh, scripture relating to heaven as well. So take a listen. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing 
for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So this passage relates, obviously, to the Old Testament saints and their situation, but it applies to us uh, today. A country has been prepared for us in heaven, and this should cause us to feel um, celebration and joy of what heaven is going to be like. It's not going to be a small uh, place, a cloud-like never region where we're hopping from one cloud to the other just to uh, navigate it's going to be gigantic, a city. Think of all the things that are in a city, the building, the streets, the shops, all the different places we're going to go. Uh, there's uh, talk of banquets in heaven, so there'll be restaurants, I'm assuming, or places for us to gather to eat. And this is all happening within the city, and then, of course, we have whatever the countryside in heaven offers us. So when we arrive in heaven, some people think of terms uh, relating to uh, like being a floating spirit. And again, this comes from uh, movies and TV primarily. But scripture tells us something quite different. And if you remember last week, we talked about Revelations chapter 6 and the saints that were under the altar. Those had been martyred for their faith, their Christian belief. Uh, and they cried out to Jesus, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, before you will judge the inhabitants on the earth and avenge our blood? Remember, they were saying, How long are you going to let that happen down there, Lord, before you do something? And listen to the response that they receive. Revelation 6, verse 11. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of fellow servants their fellow brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been. So my observation here is you don't need a white robe if you don't have a body. So when we die and we ascend to heaven, we are given intermediate bodies. And I say intermediate because eventually heaven will come down onto the new earth and certainly we will have bodies there. But as human beings, um, we are centered by our body. And so in heaven, we will have uh, bodies. Otherwise, why would they be given robes? And so there are uh, many enjoyable aspects of that. Hopefully, when I get to heaven, I'll be a smidge taller. I'll have hair. And I'll have a voice like Mac Powell, uh, the singer from Third Day, whose uh, music video will be attached to this online message. Hopefully, that's the case anyway. Now. We know we'll have bodies, but will we have emotions? Human beings are both physical and emotional creatures. And so the question becomes, will we have emotions? Here on earth, we have uh, what we would refer to as good emotions, um, joy and laughter and happiness. But we also have emotions uh, when we struggle. We uh, feel doom and depression and discouragement. These are emotions that we um, go through all the time here in this temporary life. So what about those heavier emotions? <clears throat> what are they going to be like in heaven? So let's take a look at Revelations 21, beginning in verse 3 on this particular topic. He, God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he, Jesus, who sits on the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. So one of our first experiences when we get to heaven is not only to see Jesus, but to be free of all those heavy emotions that we had to drag around as we navigated this temporary life. All the discouragement and depression and guilty uh, difficulty are gone. And now we are in heaven and we have left the temporary life and all of those negative experiences. And so all those things that plagued us in this life have been removed, which is part of the joy of eternal life. And this is why we will want to praise God when we are in heaven. Praise God always because of what's been given to us and also what's been removed that we had to endure in this temporary life. When the real life begins in heaven, not this artificial one we're living now, but when the real life begins in heaven, 
God will provide us joy and laughter and satisfaction in being in relationship with him and also with each other. This is the very definition of heaven. Uh, pastor and author John MacArthur put it this way about this particular scripture. What the scripture declares is the absence of anything to be sorry about. No sadness, no disappointment, no pain. There will be no tears of regret, tears over death of loved ones, or tears for any reason. The greatest curse of human existence, sin and death, is no more. Now, let's be honest, we have trouble imagining that because of the world we live in right now. But once we start to realize this is a temporary life, this is the before life, and that heaven is the real life, once we understand that, then we maybe don't get quite bogged down in some of the discouragement and difficulty we have here because we're looking uh, forward to heavenly things. As Paul said, we're looking heavenly, not at earthly uh, events. And all of this passes away, all of this difficulty passes away uh, when we have a heavenly destination. Now, I personally believe that there will be some tears in heaven, but not of the discouragement kind, not of the sadness or pain. There will be tears of joy and tears of reunion. Imagine all the people we're going to see when we get there. And we do need to imagine that because it gives us encouragement now. Uh, tears of celebration and of wonder at what God has done. This is the reason why we need to think about heaven so that we can better understand not only the plan of salvation to save us from this life and this world, but to understand what God has done for us eternally. And this should bring tears to our eyes for the love that God must have for us in order to uh, prepare all this for us. Um, I have put together a brief survey that's going to be attached uh, to this particular video and will also be handed out in church and provided to you uh, by other means for you to um, talk a little bit about your feelings concerning heaven. So there's five questions in the survey and they're meant to get you to think a little bit about heaven and what you might experience there and what you anticipate will happen and what you look forward to. Uh, I would ask you to fill out that survey and get it back to me and over the next couple of Sundays we will talk about some of the answers that we received uh, maybe answer a few questions that folks might have about heaven. But it's my belief that the more we try to understand paradise, the more encouragement it gives us now and the more incentive it gives us to share our faith. And I go back to my original statement, if 80% of the population that exists today or will exist in the future going forward in this temporary life doesn't make it to heaven, then we need to do something about that as believers in Jesus Christ. This is our great commission to share our faith, to share what we know. And so we should study heaven and invite conversations about heaven. Paradise is not this far away place that we should only think about when somebody dies or when we ponder our own mortality. We should think about what God has done for us as an inspiration and a way to live our life now. Heaven is the ultimate destination vacation site. And so we shouldn't just glance at the travel brochure. We should invest ourselves in the study of heaven, which is part of the conversation of this sermon series, so that we may be encouraged. And so this week, as you fill out that survey, and I hope you will do that, uh, continue to think and talk with others about what they might uh, believe will happen when we get to heaven. And we'll have more next week as well. Uh, there's a video attached to this, a music video attached along with the survey. I hope you'll uh, listen to the music and fill out the survey. Until next time we meet, be blessed.